You know, I'm gonna give you a history lesson. We got some dumbass motherfuckers floating around this country. <laughs> <laughs> start laughing! <laughs> and when I do, start <laughs> Also, y'all did some nasty ass jokes on my ass, too. Funny jokes and unfunny jokes come out of the same birth. You fing guys are unbelievable. Why are you laughing? Evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Why You Laughing, a history of comedy podcast. And today, I am pleased to introduce to you the great Joan Rivers, probably uh, the most influ. Def- I mean, definitely, I think the most influential woman in the history of comedy. But I was trying to, I was trying to put this into perspective because we often talk about uh, people with a lot of comedy children, and the ones I always name are you know Mitch Hedberg, David Tell, uh, Brian Regan, Dan Cook. Um, Sure, I suppose. Uh, I mean, obviously, Pryor and Carlin, of course, uh, Rickles, Rodney. But, like, if you're talking about influence, Joan Rivers has cornered an entire gender where I don't know if there's a woman in comedy that doesn't isn't somehow a descendant of Joan Rivers. She was the biggest female comedian uh, for a long run. She, of course, was influenced by Phyllis Diller and people like that, which we'll get into. But uh probably in my opinion the greatest female comedian ever for a number of reasons so excited to get into her career today and um talk about all of that if you want to go back and look at past episodes we have covered joan once before joan rivers versus johnny carson which we'll touch on today but we got into much more in depth in a past episode so go back through the archives if you're new to the program or uh, you haven't fully caught up then make sure you go back and listen to all the Why You Laughings. And you can also check out bonus episodes on the Patreon. Become a YouTube or Patreon member. And uh, all those links are at blindmike.net. So, if you want to support the p- program, wherever you get podcasts, all the links are available at blindmike.net. And if you want to become a subscriber, which is how we make our bread, then uh, hop on the Patreon or YouTube, all those links. Blindmike.net. Support the show. We appreciate it. Uh, and subscribe on the YouTube if you're watching there. So uh, let's get into Joan, because like I said, she was she was a, a very funny comic, very influential. And for her time, I think like unusually vicious. She, oh, yeah. she, I, she That's another thing I don't think she gets enough credit for is the brand of comedy that is very prevalent in podcasting today and was certainly on, you know, radio in the in the 90s into the 2000s. Uh, but Joan was an early, uh, you know one of the early advocates for that style of humor. So um, I I definitely don't think she gets enough credit for her standing in comedy history um, because it's a boys club, you know, which is, which which is actually oddly, I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but it's a weird, like, I don't think the women in comedy give Joan Rivers enough respect. Like you truly don't hear her name brought up enough, but we're getting too far ahead of ourselves. Let's start at the beginning here. Uh, where she wasn't always Joan Rivers. She started out as Joan Malinsky, which seems strange now, but in Hollywood back in the day, you didn't necessarily want the Jewish name. So uh, she's talking about the early days. For January, Comedy and Spice. Spice. Is that how you used to build yourself? Yes. Or someone dug that up. That's somewhere. true. When I first got out of college, I got me a manager who said, you'll never make it under the name of Joan Malinsky, which is my real name, yeah. which hurt. And uh, he named me Pepper January, Comedy and Spice. <laughs> and I really did. Very, they would book me because you hear that name, you go like, ba boom. And uh, sure. I, and I would be booked in places I can't tell you because you've never had to go through like you know strip joints. No. And I try to belong. I used to wear a G string over my dress and everything. <laughs> but, uh, Weird. It's very funny to think of a time. I just can't relate to it. I guess where Joan Malinsky, the name Joan Malinsky, no chance anyone's walking into the door to see that. <laughs> what they will see is. Pepper January, comedy with spice. <laughs> it's an incredibly long marquee. <laughs> it does make more sense when she's like, yeah, I did a lot of strip clubs. I'm like, all right, that might get both clientele in there. <laughs> but then she had a, a manager. I saw the name Tony Rivers come up, but in an interview, she said Larry Rivers was uh, her manager's name that said, uh, you got to change your name. Malinsky doesn't work. And she was like, just call me Joan Rivers, I guess. <laughs> that just it just stuck. It's a it's a time that's gone by because now you have you know Sebastian Maniscalco who doesn't have a problem selling out arenas. Nate Bragazzi, people like that. 
But I guess it is a time where it's interesting to think about. You literally had to make people remember your name, you know? Right. Like now you can just say, hey, Alexa, who's the broad that dated Sam Morrill that has a late night show now? And it'll tell you, Taylor Tomlinson, in two seconds. But back then, you had to remember, so you couldn't have a confusing name, which still vexes me on why how they settled on Pepper January Comedy with Spice. <laughs> You guys go down to see Pepper January? <laughs> that sounds like a joke in itself. <laughs> it's a, it's a, yeah, that's an SNL character or something. Right. But, but nonetheless, uh, she fi finally shed the name Pepper January, went with Joan Rivers, and uh, we, we forge on. When did you start writing jokes? Uh, not so very late. I was an actress all through high school. I was an actress all through college. I um, never, I was an actress when I got out of college. It was only because in one of my office temporary jobs, one of the models said my husband is a um, stand-up comic and he's making $6 a night. You're funny. I thought, gee, let me do that while I get my legs as an actress together. So I really went into it backwards. Never thought about being funny. Never thought I could write jokes. I bought my first and stole my first jokes off of television. It wasn't until I got to Second City that I realized whether you write it down or you say it, you're writing. But that took Second City and improvisation to let me understand that. Interesting when you hear Joan's story, because like I said, it was a very different world when Joan was coming up, especially for women. But when you hear her story coming up through comedy, she, for the most part, like I'm sure there's obviously um, sexism that she dealt with and all that kind of stuff. For sure. But for the most part, she had like a guy's career all the way through for whatever. She came up with the likes of uh, George Carlin and Woody Allen. And she said they were actually, um, she said Pryor and Carlin and people on the scene at that time were, you know, marginally, but nicer to her than other comics because she was a girl, basically. So she kind of fit right in in that crew. And like I said, she is one of the great ball busters of all time, mm -hmm. which probably played to her advantage. I don't think that was the case with a lot of women. Um, like when you look at uh, like Phyllis Diller, who definitely influenced Joan Rivers, there, it was a lot of self-deprecating stuff. You didn't have as many women attacking other people but it, because they were kind of supposed to be seen as polite. Like if you look at the women in that time coming up in comedy, it was a lot of uh, um, housewife type characters almost yeah that's why her even saying g-string on the late night show was like whoa yeah yeah <laughs> and um you look at a show like uh the marvelous mrs Maisel, um where a lot of that is based on many people but a lot of it's based on joan rivers one thing in particular that we'll get to um but i remember when we had katie hannigan on talking about women in comedy um i brought up that show and she was kind of like yeah she her problem with it was and this makes sense her issue with that show was that it kind of makes it seem like a drunk woman could just stumble on stage and fall into a 50 year comedy career. You know what I mean? It was almost like she was a comedy superhero in that show. But what I like that it did is it kind of painted someone like Joan Rivers, where it's like, if you were an edgy woman, it was much more difficult for you. Cause people didn't want to hear that from you. People were like, mm -hmm. Hey, well, this lady's supposed to be in the kitchen, you know, <laughs> supposed to be giving us uh, quilting advice or something. <laughs> Where's the apron, you bitch? <laughs> yeah. So, so Joan definitely uh, broke down a lot of those barriers, and that her her story, like we just heard, of the time was very common. Um, now you might hear it more from like L.A. comics, maybe, um, but it's pretty rare. Where like a lot of stand-up comics now, their goal was to get into stand-up comedy, whereas back in the day, and the example I always use. Uh, is Rodney Dangerfield being a singing waiter? <laughs> yeah, where it's like people ju they just wanted to perform something because you forget how new an art form stand up is. Um, like legitimately in the grand scheme of things, like if you look at the history of music, then Lenny Bruce is Mozart. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like it's a it's less than a hundred years old. At least modern stand up is w well under a hundred years old. So. Yeah, because you could thing, look like a, a jester back in the day. It's kind of like yeah. beginning. So, so that thing didn't even really exist. So even a girl that might have been funny when she was young, like Joan Rivers, is like, well, I want to be seen. I want to be noticed. Beauty was a big thing to her. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she 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 told another story of uh, when she was four years old. And I, you know, I never know how true these stories in, 
are when you hear celebrities tell them. But she said when she was four years old, um, her, her parents brought her to a play and there was a four year old on stage and she remembers thinking like, well, why can't I, that should be me up there, that sort of thing. So you, if you want to be a performer, you think I must have to be an actor because comedy doesn't really exist yet. And then that's the interesting thing about comedy this time where it's like a, you know, a, a strainer kind of filtered out the great ones and was, were like, you should be on mm. stage telling jokes. You can do this yourself if you wanted to. An interesting thing I noticed with the comics from this generation, and they have no shame in saying it, is they started by stealing jokes. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, like Milton Berle, whereas, you know, Carlos Mencia was called out by Joe Rogan and it was a whole big thing. Milton Berle at the time, the whole thing was like, hey, don't be f too funny around old Milty. He'll steal from you. Yeah. And he's got a massive penis. Those are the two <laughs> things I know about that, man. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was it was very uh, commonplace. And to reference uh, Mrs. Maisel again, that show starts with uh, her husband getting laughs on stage, and she realizes he's just stealing from Bob Newhart. <laughs> <laughs> and so that is, I think, I think it was uh, much more common at the time. And like we talked about uh, with Carrot Top, it does make sense in the sense of like getting reps in. If you're just going to an open mic, now it's impossible. Because yeah. anyone at open mic is going to be like, hey, that's a Jezelneck joke, asshole. Yeah, and, and people are using it to just get comfortable in front of people and on stage. Exactly. Yeah, right. Like back then when no no one knew it was, a, you know, a, a Lenny Bruce or a Stephen Wright or something like that, then it just helps you get comfortable. You're not necessarily stealing from anyone. It's more of a like taking batting practice. Right. Uh, but next we have uh, Jack Parr. Okay, so this is an interesting, uh, I, I had not heard this story before, but this is from her early days trying to get on TV. Jack Parr, of course, um, was the Tonight Show host before Carson. Uh, was he the, I think he was the original Tonight Show host. I'm trying to remember now. Steve Allen, Jack Parr, Jack Benny. I think Jack Parr was the first, but I'll leave it in the comments if you can remember better than me. Uh, but sorry, here's that story. First television appearance, I was brought up by an agent to the Jack Parr show. And um, I thought it went very well because I was then in office temporary. So I was telling him I used to steal stamps and sell them for half price, which is all true. And I told him these stories. I said, I'm from Large Run. My dad's a doctor. And uh, what was my joke? Oh, he spent two years in uh, medical school, two years in Tijuana, you know, his first words are, does that look right to you, nurse? And she always says, it doesn't matter, doctor. And uh, the next day, a man named Bob Shanks brought me up. The next day uh, at the meeting, they said, gee, that girl was funny to Parr. And Parr said, she was a liar. A doctor's daughter doesn't steal stamps. And he took a pencil and put it through my name. <sighs> and I was on earth, I floating. I thought I had done so well. She's a liar. A doctor's daughter doesn't steal stamps. Were you back on his show at any Never. point? Never. That was it. <laughs> I like that phrase, a liar. Like, do you think Rodney's wife actually called him from a hotel after sex? You know? <laughs> I mean, a liar. She was telling jokes. <laughs> uh, and to, to real quick, save the commenters. It's Steve Allen was the first. Steve Allen was the first? Okay, I apologize. But this is the Jack Parr show anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, I do think that's where... Uh, women probably encountered much more sexism rather than trying to get on stage. Because like I said, with stand-up, it wasn't even a respected art form yet. They were like men were playing strip clubs and dive bars and all these places. So it was kind of the same for the women. Where, Leno talks about it all the time. Yeah. Where they dealt with more sexism is, I think, the television business. Where it was legitimately like, uh, listen, sweetheart, you know, aren't you the, aren't you the secretary? That sort of thing. Um, so you hear Jack Parr, that, like I said, where do you think fucking Henny Youngman, every, every story told was a hundred percent by the book truthful, you know? So that's the type of shit that I you, think uh, women probably dealt with a little more. Do you think Dice was actually in line at the bank with his tongue in some chicks? <laughs> that I saw that happened. There's footage of that actually. <laughs> uh, but next we have her talking about censors. Uh, yeah, I get, you know every uh, old episode i think the same examples come up with uh pregnancy and all that sort of stuff that uh, now when you see what's on television particularly like premium cable it blows your mind to think what they couldn't get away with uh but this is the, some of the stuff that joan had to deal with days in those days and even in these days stand-up is very different what you're allowed to say ed sullivan i was pregnant 
on Ed Sullivan. I wasn't allowed to say I was pregnant. I was in a tent. And I had to say, soon I'll hear the pitter patter of little feet. It was very careful. Uh, I did a joke that was so um, easy and it was scandalous in those days. Uh, what did I say? Uh, it's my daughter's birthday. And nine months ago today, I was screaming, get me out of this. And nine months ago, uh, 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 one year She ago, takes a minute here. She's old. Give her a break, all right? She's 70-something here. <laughs> she she gets there and delivers. <laughs> a year ago, nine months ago. It's my daughter's birthday today. She's a year old. And a year ago today, I was screaming, get, me, get this out of me. And a year ago, nine months, I was saying the same thing. Well, <laughs> I <pretty> mean, <laughs> it was scandalous. When I was hosting the Carson show, after the whole thing was approved, they would send this guy in, the censor, and I would fight with him over words. Bitch versus slut was a major thing. Was this clot worthy? Ver no clot worthy? He was a, a black man. Okay. And he said to me, you can say slut, you can't say bitch. And I took him by the hand to every secretary in NBC and said, would you rather be called bitch or <laughs> slut? And they all said, well, bitch is fun. Could not say bitch. Slut stings. <laughs> I, I, I think it's the opposite now. I think bitch, you can definitely say slut. You probably can't get away with a network, I would think. Well, you go to any of those rallies, and everyone has a shirt that says "I'm a slut" on it. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, <laughs> um, but yeah, but the, but the joke she told, where uh, you know uh, she's yelling, "Get this thing out of me!" Nine months ago, I was saying the same thing. That's a, essentially a rape joke. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's very edgy for that time. <laughs> yeah, it's edgy now. So that, that's what I'm saying is like now, and it's like I say with Norman Lear, the phrase I always use with he's a trailblazer. And we've been dragging brush back over the, those roads where, you know, she's fighting for the to get these things on NBC in, you know, 1973 or whatever it is. And uh, and now there's no way you're getting on the, that on the air. Like if Mark Norman went on found with that joke, I don't think that would air, you know? No, <laughs> no. They'd be like, yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, that, that's the that's the type of joke and again it's clean ish you know like i said it is a rape joke basically yeah. but it's it, it, you wouldn't i'm trying to think of how to phrase it it's not you know jim norton type of filthy i guess um so it's, like, it's the cleanest rape joke you'll ever hear exactly yeah 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 that's a that's a good way of saying it <laughs> so uh that i think that is where Joan was a, a trailblazer, where she was at the forefront of uh, breaking down some of those walls, because that is the type of shit that she found funny. It was just like, some of that brutal humor. Yeah. And uh, here she is talking about her first Tonight Show. Uh, yeah. So I th there is footage of her on a Tonight Show in the 60s, but I don't believe it's the first one, because when Carson brings her out, he mentions that you've seen her on um, the show before. Uh, because uh, what's weird about the Tonight Show is a lot of those episodes from the '60s, from Carson's early run, they were taped over because no, like I guess people just thought like, who's ever going to use these again? So they're just gone forever. Right? Like some of them you're able to find now, um, but a lot of them from the early days are, are pretty rare. So uh, I wasn't able to find her exact first appearance, but she talks about it here. I was brought up eight times. I was then already out of Second City. I'd gone to Second City, which changed my life, really, because I found myself. And then I was working in little clubs, and I was writing already. And uh, I was writing for Canada Camera. So they brought me on as a girl writer. So I never, uh, I think I was the only comic ever to be on the Carson Show that never did a stand-up, ever. I was brought out as, as a so people always say, well, you did your stand-up. Never did a stand-up on Carson. What did you do? They brought me out as a girl writer, so I sat on the couch. Which is a much better spot to be in. For that show, for sure. I think you would much rather do panel with Johnny, because especially the way it was back in those days, like Carson would kind of set up your bits. So you're doing your stand-up, but also having a conversation with Johnny Carson, um, which is, you know, a, I think a much more comfortable way to do it. But uh, that's what I was referring to when I said uh, the show, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, 
directly used that in the last season and they kind of spun it as like a, a slap in the face like oh fine we'll have ron as a writer which in a way it is because you're saying she can't handle stand up the way you know the guys on this show would the way bob newhart would or something um but you put her in a more comfortable spot and johnny liked her and at the end of her appearance johnny said um you know she's gonna be a big star and then back in those days that meant something <laughs> like when carson gave you the stamp of approval uh that really meant something so she never did i don't think she ever did stand up on the tonight show she was cemented like i said that second appearance that i found um she's doing panel again where they bring her out as like a writer of the show which is again a weird i suppose it's viewed as like a as putting her down or viewing her lesser than but it's saying hey she's a writer on the show so she's got my blessing and all like she writes some of the words that i say and also we're putting her on the couch and having a conversation with her so yeah. i think it was a failed attempt at sexism there i guess you know that goal everyone every comic has she's just skipping the hard part and sitting right on the couch yeah <laughs> uh next uh we have morning show uh oh yeah so she got a show on um nbc in the mornings which feels like you know letterman also had this spot too i think it, it was like a an attempt after the today show to kind of keep that going but inject a little comedy um and i guess even in recent years when you would see like kathy lee and hoda drinking wine in that time slot uh i guess this is the original version of that where they were like bring in joan make things a little looser and they gave her that spot and uh it, it lasted a few years but uh it wasn't you know the the career maker that she wanted necessarily and that was right out of the box on carson nbc came to me and i was a hot girl in town and they gave me a little morning show and it followed the today show and uh we did that show and it was looking back it was a sweet show i interviewed people you know i did a monologue and i interviewed and it was an easy morning show and it was fine. Everybody that was on the Carson show, you know, so you had on whoever was current. The only one that ever walked off was Jerry Lewis. I don't know what I said. He got up and walked off in the middle of the show. That was very <laughs> dramatic though. But we had whoever was hot came on the show. Just ran its course. I think shows were changing. I got bored. I get very bored. I, I don't know how Letterman does it. I don't know how you do it. I don't want to ask. I took my uh, my afternoon show, which came out later on, mm -hmm. off finally, because I said, I just don't care about asking somebody getting lies back from them. I understand you girls are fighting on the set. No, we all love each other. I'm out of here. <laughs> so Joan was kind of a weird hybrid where she was a comic for the ladies i imagine she had a largely female audience but like i said she was pretty brutal and vulgar and raunchy which you would think fits more in late night so i think it was hard to find a spot for her specifically you know what she would have been great on and it was just nothing like that existed at the time and this feels like maybe a put down, but I don't mean it that way. But she would have been an awesome member of The View, I think. She would have really mixed it up with those ladies, you know? She would be saying call. something about the Holocaust. Joan's calling her an idiot. Could have been yeah. fun. It would have been great. <laughs> I, You know, she kind of stayed away from politics for the most part, but she wasn't afraid to go after people, as uh, we will we will see in a little bit. Um, so, yeah, it, it was she was a, a tough because she was so original and unique at that time, I think it was tough for people to like cast her in any way. There wasn't a cookie cutter role that people could put her in. So I think she just kind of had to experiment and try a bunch of stuff. And eventually she kind of found out that stand up was really what she excelled at more than anything else. Um, but she mentions Jerry Lewis in there, that Jerry Lewis walked off the show. I couldn't find that specifically and i don't know if it's from this appearance or he, he was on multiple times um but there is an appearance i think it's split in two parts on youtube of jerry lewis having a conversation with like a a child behavioral expert of some kind 
And it's Joan Rivers, this expert in Jerry Lewis, talking about disciplining your kids. And the therapist or whatever he is, is basically saying you shouldn't hit your kids. And Jerry is giving an impassioned speech about why you should hit your kids. He's like, I hit my kids and they thank me for it. It's, it's pretty wild if you go back and watch it. <laughs> and, and a totally different time. I'm sure Jerry was not alone. Like I said, this was on NBC. So it's not like it was the craziest opinion in the world at that time. But with 2024 goggles on, it's interesting to go back and watch. So I don't know if it was the same appearance where he got heated after that and stormed out, but it wasn't on camera if, if that is the same instance. It's like when Connery said, like, yeah, it's fine to slap your woman if she's being mouthy. Uh, yeah, if she's, if she's misbehaving, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, here she is talking about Jerry Lewis. Yeah, so speaking of Jerry Lewis, like I said, I couldn't find him storming off her morning show, but uh, that's not the only interaction Joan and Jerry ever had. Jerry Lewis, right. who I I got angry at years ago. I did his telethon, and I, in my own way, I do a lot of, yeah. you know, quiet stuff. And I did his telethon, and he was standing there with a child next to him saying, this kid is going to die. And I said, I will <laughs> never do this telethon again. You do not say in front of a little boy who's going to die, this child is going to die. Who are you? You unfunny, lucky, stupid <laughs> asshole. So <laughs> he got he took on bridge. <laughs> and I had forgotten because I block a lot of stuff out. He had actually uh, threatened to have people come and beat me up. Yeah. He did. And I'm, I'm, I was still married at the time. My husband was still alive at the time. And uh, we said, that, Done. Never talk about it. I don't want to be beaten. I don't want my knees broken over yeah. Jerry Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> she does the impression of him. <laughs> yeah, so Jerry Lewis is gonna like have her have the mafia come after Joan Rivers or something. And he talked about this. We played the clip in the Jerry Lewis episode with what a miserable bastard Jerry Lewis is. He talked about that with uh, Maria Menounos, I think, where um, uh, she asked him about this, and he like bragged about it. And he, he was like, yes, you know, I wasn't necessarily going to do anything, but I wanted to let her know that I could. He was, very, <laughs> he was like kind of, he, he was kind of remembering the good old days when you could break a woman's knees if you mouthed off. That's right. Um, but yeah, like uh, that clip made me also think like, I think Joan would have been great in the podcasting era. She, or oh, maybe yeah. if like Sirius XM or something existed earlier than it did. Like, like I said, with, them not being able to find her niche necessarily that would have been great is a radio show where jones just going after hollywood types and she knew how to ruffle some feathers she sure did um next we have uh her movie uh yeah so she talks about this too and this is, again goes to what i'm talking about where like they tried a bunch of things with joan and she she was i mean definitely popular but I, I guess what I'm trying to say ultimately, and we've talked about this with a few different guys, where at that time, like, you wanted to be more than a stand-up. Everyone that got big enough left stand-up when they could. Whereas now, Joan would be playing arenas. And of course, I mean, she played massive venues for the time, absolutely. But, like, now you see someone touring like Shane Gillis, where it's like, oh, he could just be a successful stand-up for the next... 30 years and then retire comfortably, you know? Yeah. Uh, whereas that, it wasn't as much the, like she was definitely well off, but it didn't make you as much of a star. Um, I like, I'm, I know I'm phrasing it wrong. Cause I know we're going to get comments saying like, Oh, you don't think George Carlin and Richard Pryor were big? Of course they were, but just the idea of like arena acts, it was, you know, Steve Martin dice. And then that's it for 20 years, basically. Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Yeah, but again, Eddie Murphy left stand up as soon as he could. Yes, he did. You know, proving, so proving the point. Yeah, so, but yeah, this is her talking about her uh, brief movie career. And how did you come to write and direct Rabbit Test? Rabbit Test, I wanted to do a funny movie. And I worked with a man named Jay Reddick, and we wrote Rabbit Test, and we were too early. We were right before Airplane and right before. Uh, Animal House, and we got creamed by the critics. This is not fun. We had Imogene Coca spraying Lysol on dinner because she wants to make it really nice for her family and clean. And <laughs> a year later, Animal House came out. No, uh, 
air, airplane came out and they threw the shit at the fan. And with us, they said, Lysol and meat, disgusting, horrible. And with Animal House uh, airplane, they said, funniest thing we've ever seen. So yeah. too, too early, too early. It's funny. I watched it like four years ago. It's funny. Yeah, and she she never really she said like, hey, maybe if I stuck with it, I could have been you know the female Woody Allen or something. But like she said, that process kind of turned her off to the movie business. She just didn't like how it turned out, really. Um, and she, I think she directed that film as well. So she just didn't love the process, and which again s- sent her back to stand up and late night television, the two she, kind of mainstays of her career. She's got like a great outlook on everything. She's like, with her, her morning show, she's like, yeah, it ran its course. With this, she's like, yeah, we were too early. <laughs> she does seem to. And that's what's interesting about her is like with her comedy, you would think she'd be super negative about everything. But she really doesn't seem that way. Like, no. she'll be negative for comedy's sake. But, uh, you know, I don't think really had that outlook ultimately. Although there's definitely some darkness there, too, with like the amount of surgery she got and everything. Oh, there's yeah. definitely some some inner turmoil going on about her looks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, but yeah, ultimately, I think she generally seemed to like like what she did. Um, next, we have her talking about guest hosting. Yeah, so this enters uh, the Tonight Show phase of her career, where um, you know you hear different stories where Peter Peter Lasalle basically says like, "We were left no option. We had to pick Joan because um, you know Cosby." Well, she says Cosby didn't want to do it, and Shandling eventually didn't want to do it. Like we were left with no choice. Whereas Joan will tell you the story, and I believe this is true, that she was a ratings monster when she filled in for Johnny. First of all, I was uh, the first woman guest host they gave it to, and apparently that worked very well. I've always been a worker, so I never watch when things are happening. I'm so my head is always down. I would have been great on the pyramids. <laughs> and um, <laughs> then they were looking for permanent guest host, which I didn't even know, and they offered it to Cosby. And Bill said, no, give it to Joan. She's better. Cosby helping yet another woman along in her career. <laughs> <That guy. laughs> he paid Melissa's college off, I heard. He can't, can't <laughs> stop helping the ladies. And they offered it to me. And it was a brilliant move on their part to get a woman and to get someone outrageous. Because, you know, Johnny was very safe. And so people would watch me because I was so outrageous in those days and uh and it worked very well i got from the beginning my ratings were higher than his which they never told me they never treated me um i don't want this to turn to a pity party interview but it was uh uh you weren't welcomed into the nbc family you were treated like an outsider yeah and i i wonder i wonder if that is a a, a sexism thing or if it's more i'm more of the opinion that it was out of fear of Carson <laughs> where like she said, she, they, she wasn't allowed to use the tonight show booker because if Johnny saw that she had a major guest, he would flip out and say, why don't we have that guest when right. I, when I'm in? Um, so basically she wasn't given the same advantages, obviously that Johnny was because it was Johnny's show and everyone was out to appease the boss. Um, so I think, it, I think it was a little more of that where, uh, people were out to appease Carson and you were on your own on Monday nights. Now, to me, that's a strange mentality because I would say to Johnny, like, hey, maybe start working on Mondays then, you know, if it matters yeah. that much to you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like, I, I agree with her where, like, it was smart of them to use her as opposed to someone like um, Jay Leno or Jerry Seinfeld at that time or whoever. It's like another straight laced white guy who's going to make kind of uh you know down the middle jokes or do you want joan who is much different than uh than anything you saw on uh, you know uh, from a late night host at that time now you might say now hey joan just made everything a, a sex reference or a shot at some celebrity how many people have we seen like that well before joan not a lot now everyone because i do believe that every female comedian to an extent is copying Joan Rivers. I mean, I think Roseanne was a definitely had her own voice and there's definitely some people that are built more in the model of Roseanne, Mm -hmm. but it's really like, I think the, the mold of successful female comedians over the last 20 years 
they are all Joan Rivers clones. And like I said, stand up is so young that I think now, like this generation of comics, you're starting to see people who are influenced by Joan Rivers, but not exact replicas of her. Right. Like, I think the lineage, kind of similar to how we talked about, you know, Red Fox to Pryor to Eddie Murphy, there's like a very, you can kind of see the through line there of influence. Yep. I think clear, like Phyllis Diller, Joan Rivers, Sarah Silverman, and then 900 other women comedians after that. Like, you can definitely see the lineage there. But I think now when you look at like, you know, Jordan Jensen and Kelsey Cook and Taylor Tomlinson and Beth Stelling, you can definitely see like Joan Rivers type influence with them. But they're not just knockoffs of her. You know, they're not just doing what she did in modern times. They've found their own voice. And that's what I'm talking about with comedy being young is like that does take time when women have very few role models in comedy. It does take people like Ellen DeGeneres and Roseanne and you know Kathleen Madigan and other people to start popping up where it's like, oh, well, maybe I could be a little more like this lady or add some of that into my act, you know, Maria Bamford. I don't know. I just feel like oh, that's a, that's actually yeah. I was trying to think of someone like Maria Bamford. Perfect example. Where she, yes, she's weird. And you didn't see that in female comics as much. And that's what I think makes Maria Bamford great. Yeah. She didn't need feel the need to be exactly like everyone else. You know, like I think Sarah Silverman is unique. She's definitely influenced by Joan Rivers, but I think she was unique and funny. And then I think a lot of women tried to just be Sarah Silverman, which is yeah. kind of the problem with, uh, you know, um, like Amy Schumer and Nikki Glaser and people like that that kind of came out. Yeah, I think uh, weird is a perfect word to describe Maria Bamford. <laughs> oh, she's a nut. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she did a, a, a like an hour special just to her parents. Yes, and uh, also talked about being in an insane asylum, so legitimately insane. Yeah. Um, but next we have uh, uh, Fox and Carson. Yeah, so this is where things uh, get a little ugly. Like I said, we did a whole episode about it, so I didn't want to spend too much time on it. Go back and watch that, Joan Rivers versus Johnny Carson. Cover the full saga. Um, but this is her talking about kind of, uh, you know, the, the ugly end. So Joan was getting better ratings than Johnny. Fox, which is a new network, says, well, we should just hire her then, right? Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then there were a few things like, you know, I, I do think it's a different demographic. That's pr probably the reason Jones ratings were higher is because people just watched the tonight show at that time. But then you also get like maybe women who didn't give a fuck about Carson watching Joan. Whereas when she's on Fox, maybe you get those women that liked her, but the people that like Johnny are sticking with Johnny, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I think it was tough for her to kind of find, kind of find her footing. Johnny cut off all ties with her. And then uh, she talks about the end of the run there. And you show it in the film. Fox dropped you. I got hot cake. Looking back in retrospect, big mistake to take that job. Big mistake for them to fire me. Nice. They must have had a reason. They, it was you never personal. get into it much in the show. It's the why they fired. Uh, Edgar and Barry. They blamed do. your husband. Yeah, yeah. And they gave me a choice. You can stay, but your husband goes, has to go. And I said, then I go with my husband. And it was Thursday to Friday. Over and out. Now, Carson, may, I mean, he put you on, he, you were the guest host. Why did he get so mad? I that still you don't know. And you knew him better than I. He should have been proud. He should have been proud. I finally, at the after my contract was up, done, I took another job. Everybody did. Cosby did. David Brennan did. We all did. We all went on. I think because I was a woman, he never thought... I would leave, or maybe, maybe he liked me better. But the minute I became competition, it became out to kill me. It kind of goes back to what you said before, about she has a good perspective on things because I do think that's kind of true. Where maybe, maybe he did like her more, and mm -hmm. was genuinely hurt by the fact that she didn't call him first. Now I understand, like we talked about uh, in the episode. I understand her reasons for not calling Carson because she thought it might have blown the deal up and he would have shut it down probably. Yeah. Um, so I get that to an extent, but I also like, she does talk about very glowingly, like Johnny made my career. Now then comes in the question of, 
and being a guy that's listened to a lot of Howard Stern, I think about this a lot, where Howard would have these people that he would kind of, uh, you know, he, he built them up for sure, but then felt like they owed him forever. Uh, and I would say, I, I think in radio in general, that's kind of a trend because Opie and Anthony sort of had that with, with some people. Well, Opie more so. Oh, I was going to say Opie more so. <laughs> Opie had that with a lot of people. Um, where it's like, how often do you thank these people? And I would hear Jim Norton talk about that. He said, like, I, I thanked Opie and Anthony in my book in every comedy special. I would stop the show and have them stand up and thank them. <laughs> Uh, I thank them in every interview I did. I would go out and do interviews where people would criticize Open Anthony. I would have to defend them. He's like, "How? When can I stop thanking you?" I guess is the question. You know, how right. much thanks is enough eventually, where I can be my own person? And I think that's something Joan Rivers was dealing with with uh, uh, with Johnny, where it's like, I, I didn't betray you. Like I'm doing. They offered me a show, and I took it. Um, but you know, I guess ultimately, ultimately I understand. Cause I think Johnny was a very competitive guy and he did make these people's careers, you know, like you hear, yeah. you hear people talk about, you know, the next day I had to deal with NBC or I started getting recognized or whatever, like that is thanks to Carson. So I understand him having an ego about that. What I never understood with Carson was the complete, you know, you'd think after, you know, five or six years, like when her husband kills himself, Maybe he gives her a phone call then or something. But with him, it was just like nothing. Never again. You're dead to me. Uh, next, uh, we're going to go a sad route here and talk about Edgar. Yeah, so Edgar was her husband that I mentioned. Uh, it took his own life. And um, he was a big part of her career. Not just on stage where she would talk about him a lot. Like Edgar, Edgar became a character that Joan's audience knew. Like if you listen to Joan's stand-up or her, her talk show appearances, she didn't have to say my husband. She could just say Edgar, and everyone knew who she was talking about. Um, but behind the scenes, he was also uh, influential as well, where uh, you heard Joan reference it with Larry King there, where um, what you know caused a lot of friction with Fox at the end was Edgar to the point where they said him or us, and she was like, ah, fuck, I guess him. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, uh, he took his own life. He went to Pennsylvania and uh, ended his life. And that's what she's talking about here. I finally came back after uh, my husband killed himself. And I went on stage the first time. And it was a very big room in Las Vegas. And you knew that they were all, they knew what was wrong. So I just walked out and said, my husband killed himself. First joke. And um, it was my fault. We were making love and I took the bag off my head. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it gets me, everything gets me through. And it gets my, my friends through and my family, because my daughter Melissa, uh, talking to when my husband uh, committed suicide, uh, it was terrible, 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 obviously. Uh, and Melissa was 15 at the time, and I wasn't home, and uh, my husband had gone to Philadelphia to kill himself. And uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> funny. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't home, and she got the phone call. And some moron said to a 15 year old girl, Is your mother home? And she said, No. He said, Well, please tell her. Your father committed suicide. I mean, just, yeah, you have no idea. And she had spoken to my husband the night before because he had gone to Philadelphia and he had called her and she said, are you coming home, daddy? And he said, tomorrow, hung up and killed himself. So I had a 15-year-old girl who had gotten the news, had to tell me, and then had spoken to my husband and kept saying, what, what could I have said? What could I have said? And which is nothing. If you are aware of suicides, you can't stop with a phone call. But um, it was just awful. I would say if you if they were trying to pass legislation that like if a guy calls a, a home and a 15 year old girl answers and he says, hey, your dad just killed himself like that guy probably belongs in jail. I wouldn't have a problem with that. At least a hefty fine. What Some a, piece, a piece of shit. Jesus. Oh, I, she is. Brave. I like that. Talking about that like that immediately is crazy. Well, that's, that's that, so that, that, ugly. That, that, he killed himself. For, for so many reasons, it's it's ballsy, it's brave, um, because A, suicide was a thing that people just didn't really talk about back then. Right. Um, like mental health was not nearly uh, as, as, as common or as, like now it's trendy, whereas right. back then it was, you know, thought of with a completely negative connotation. 
Um, so, so the idea of suicide and particularly being a woman, like it was a weird time where people would be like, well, what were you doing as a wife to, to cause this, you know? Mm. So for her to joke about it that way and literally make it just an ugly joke. Like I took the bag off my head during sex. That's why I killed himself. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> it's, 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 and, and, and again, like that is very common in comedy now, particularly with podcasts and stuff like that. But in the, 80s that was kind of unheard of like joan was uh i'm not gonna say the only one of her kind but certainly one of the first to be as uh outrageous and and raunchy as she was especially for a woman honestly Mm. um next we have her talking about uh or her roasting celebrities yeah so this is i mean what she was great at and i think joan had a tremendously like solid and steady career as well too where i was talking about her never finding like her niche that blew her up completely to make her a a superstar but she did for you know 50 years just work consistently and was always in like the zeitgeist to where you know uh back in the day she had carson and all this stuff but then to like people from my generation know her better as the lady who just is roasting people on the red carpet. You know, I was, I was going to say, I don't know. I think we're not giving her enough credit on how famous she actually was. Well, that, that you saying that bothers me. Cause now I know I'm not doing her justice. I'm trying <laughs> not to come off that way. I'm aware she was incredibly famous. Yeah. What I'm saying is like, now she'd be an arena act. You know what I mean? Oh. And that's something that people of that gen, like even like Rickles, Rodney, people that were huge at that time, just stand up as an art form wasn't as big as it is now. Right. So that's what I'm trying to say is we're like, okay, someone of Joan River, excuse me, someone at Joan Rivers level of stand up in 1970 would now be a rock star. Yes. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. I mean, okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, she was, she was tremendously famous for a very long time. Um, but yeah, she actually, she, the, those red carpets things from that was like her prime for us. Like you were just saying, yeah, those were huge. They, they were huge. Like they were referenced in like kids movies. Like I, Joan Rivers was in Shrek. You know right. what I mean? Like, right. uh, like that, that was just part of the zeitgeist was her and Melissa, you know, re- tracking down celebrities and roasting their outfits on the red carpet. Um, so that, that's one of the things she was great at was talking shit about celebrities. I only joke about people in the act uh, that I usually say something I don't like about them. Correct. So it's usually about someone I don't like. Not in Cher's case, it was a whole other thing. It was about what she used to wear in a funny thing. And she loved being in the act and we were friends. But usually it's someone you really don't like and you say something about them. Did anyone ever call you? or uh, Mary Tyler Moore w- didn't talk to me for 10 years. What did you say bad about her? And I said to her one time, what did I say about you? Why aren't you? She said, you called me the, you said I look like the Joker when I smile. And I said to her, number one, it's not a good joke. <laughs> I was out of the act probably the same day. But people remember these things. But I um, uh, usually what I say about them, I, I, I really believe. <laughs> you mean when you say it? I, 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 that's why I say, can we talk? I talked about when Michael Jackson died and suddenly became this great hero. The America, the world went nuts. I said, has everyone forgotten? He was a druggie and a pedophile. <laughs> and uh, and then I saw, and I won't go into what I said in the act, but I said, and well, he did. This one guy called that. He did the moonwalk, Miss Rivers. I said. The knocks were after me. I'd be walking backwards too. <laughs> <laughs> but I try to tell the truth. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she would just call Elizabeth Taylor fat and you know, just like, like all these celebrities. And that's another thing where like Hollywood was so, you know, small in those days mm-hmm. that you would kind of have to run into these people. And especially when you're Joan Rivers and you're on the red carpet at all these events the fucking balls that it takes to call these people ugly and dumb. <laughs> it would be like a thing where someone would walk on, it, someone would appear on the screen in a dress and you just, cause you couldn't see them on the whole time. You just hear it go like, ugh, like, <laughs> oh, that's horrible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that, she, honestly, that's another thing. I like, she probably, I talk about her influence on female comics, but like, you listen to the way she talks and you think of like the guys at the comedy cellar table, like the tough crowd group. Right. It's like Joan Rivers would have fit perfectly in with that crew. Oh, yeah. You know what she I mean? Was, 
she might be she might have given birth to that table. <laughs> she she like might have been one of the nastiest ones at that table, you know. <laughs> <I'm not kidding. laughs> it's like everyone worrying about what they were wearing to see her, not Patrice. <laughs> yeah, right. It would be it would be yeah. You're afraid young comics are afraid of being called gay by Rich Voss, Patrice O'Neill, and Joan Rivers. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, this next part we talked about before the show that I don't recall this ever. The uh, the hatred towards Chelsea Handler. <laughs> Yeah, so it's interesting because I I thought it for I I saw her saying something nice about uh Kathy Griffin. And I guess they were uh you know somewhat close in, in real life and liked each other and everything. And I was like, Oh, I wonder if Joan is just one of those ladies that loved all these female comics, like doesn't mind that she influenced them, whatever. Like, um like we talk about with Stern, Stern was very bitter that he had all these clones. Right. And when I saw Joan and Kathy Griffin, I was like, oh, maybe Joan's not quite like that. Well, I'm not so sure when you hear her talk about Chelsea Handler. Yeah, it's. Uh, so this is uh, Chelsea Handler. You know, Joan Rivers was big at the E Network and Chelsea Handler in her prime had a late night talk show on E. Now, who was the first female in late night but Joan Rivers? <laughs> Uh, so you would say that Chelsea was clearly influenced by Joan, but it seems Chelsea didn't really ever want to acknowledge that. Let me tell you, number one. It doesn't seem like so bad. The girl made it on her back fucking the president. We all know that. Uh, <laughs> the network. Number oh, two, my God, you promised you were not going to no, say no, no, that. I, too bad. No, she saw it. Wait, maybe somebody missed it. What did you just say, John? It doesn't matter. Uh, we all know how she got there. <laughs> number two, she's fine. She's ordinary. She's not a genius. She's an ordinary girl that she was fucking somebody high up in the industry and they gave her a break and she's doing okay. <laughs> I went over very nice. Joan, why don't you fuck someone high up in the industry? <laughs> because nobody said. wanted me. <laughs> yeah, <go ahead>. uh, <laughs> uh, I went over to this thing that we had and I went into the room and s went right over to her and said, exactly, hello. She obviously has no manners. I don't know where she comes from. Jersey. But I walk over <laughs> and say, hello, nice to see you. You say, ignored me. Oh, wow. That's number one. Who the fuck do you think you are? That's number one. Number two, she gets up and they say, Chelsea broke into late night for women. Chelsea has started for women. And they, said she, they said she had sent for, she gives so many young comedians their breaks. Their breaks. Right, right. And also a lot about women in late night. <laughs> so I walked up with a joke. I said, and I want to thank Chelsea uh, for giving me my break. Uh, that's I, fun. Michelle, <laughs> she doesn't have no jokes because she's not that clever. Huh. So that was number one. <laughs> and number two, I thought it was very funny. And I said, E, we're really the same up here. Right. You get the big studio. I don't even have a dressing room. Right. That's funny. We got laughs. Right, right. So whatever she is, she's a drunk. She has her own show. I don't wish her good luck. I don't wish her bad luck. And she used to do jokes about Melissa and me before we mean jokes. You know what I'm saying? For right. no reason. When she was first starting. Go fuck yourself in a pool, in a, as my mother said, in a teacup of water. Right. I didn't say the first part. <laughs> Why would you fuck yourself? yourself in a teacup of water? I don't mother, in other words, <laughs> what was with your mother? go drown yourself in a teacup of water. Uh -huh. um, I don't care. I don't right. think she's particularly funny. We all know how she got what she got. She's doing okay. Good. You're referring to the fact that she was dating Ted Harbour. Dating? Well, but she was living with Ted Harbour. Yeah, whatever. Right. right. What, good. I don't care. But don't you come after me, you whore. Oh. <laughs> just fucking so much viciousness there do her first of all like we just talked about her husband killing herself and right there she's like just go drown yourself <laughs> you <bitch. laughs> but that is like and th that's what i'm talking about where it's like uh you know i think certain people should understand like you're not you're not supposed to thank people forever you know what i mean like i was saying with stern where it's like you don't have to, you know, be beholden to someone just because they gave you their stuff. But you should kiss the ring a little bit. Like, Chelsea Handler should be aware, oh, I'm a woman in late night that does pretty much the exact type of comedy that Joan Rivers was doing. Hey, thanks, Joan. <laughs> you know, if I see you at the same network parties that I'm at, maybe I should say, hey, big fan or something, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Joan just fucking cut you whore. <laughs> <laughs> and just calls her out for banging the president like has no and this is like right at the this is at the height of uh chelsea handler by the way that joan's calling her out for all this I, and I, I like uh starting being like yeah they dated and she's like is that what you call it <laughs> <laughs> and uh there's another there's like a 10-hour compilation of joan on howard 
And um, there's another instance where uh, Howard asks her about Lisa Lampanelli. And she's like, I don't, I don't have any thoughts about Lisa Lampanelli. And she's like, and Howard's like, uh, a lot of people are saying that she's the new Joan Rivers. And Joan goes, oh, come on. <laughs> she was insulted by it. She goes, yeah, no, we get, we got you. You have sex with black men. We'll write another joke. We understand. <laughs> like just trashing Lisa Lampanelli. <laughs> rightfully so remember that friggin' auditorium meltdown she had it is it is like lisa lampanelli Lampanelli had a run i always heard um don like the new the this generation's don rickles yeah and i was like how dare you (laughs) right don rickles is still alive to hear this how dare you (laughs) well he was at the time (laughs) no kidding (laughs) um uh yeah so joe joan had no problem uh going at people which i I, I I definitely respect. Like she was nice to the people that were good to her and appreciative of her. But if you crossed her, she had no problem fucking chewing you down. Next, we have um, uh, Melissa talking to known rapist Matt Lauer about her death. <laughs> has nothing to do with the story. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just I I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about that guy, and he pops up in my face. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So jo- I'm like Joan all the way up until her death was like never lost a step really she died at 81 never lost a step and even like rickles who i love and granted rickles was 88 which 81 to 88 is a big difference Mm -hmm. um but like rickles did a lot of the same material like if you saw rickles twice live there were a lot of jokes he would repeat like kind of you know crowd work that he had Joan was riffing, and I'm sure she still did a lot of the same material towards the end, but Joan would like riff in a way that for a woman in her 70s was always incredibly sharp. And she was doing a lot of topical stuff, which at that age is very impressive. But like we talked about, um, had a tremendous amount of surgeries, was always very, um, that was a major insecurity of hers were her looks, obviously, and she would joke about the amount of plastic surgery she would have and all that kind of stuff. And then she went in for a, you know, a tune-up at the <laughs> age of 81, which it's like, once you hit 81, Joan, just be, you know, be happy you're still ticking. But uh, here they are talking about that. There were wild stories. What did you hear that bothered you the most? I think the selfie. Explain it for people who don't know the story. Um, there was a story circulating that during the procedure, the doctors were taking selfies of themselves with my mother while they were working on my mom. Is it true? Allegedly. They weren't taking selfies. They were taking pictures of each other. Working. So it wasn't technically a selfie. Correct. But your mom was in the picture. Allegedly. Have you seen any of those pictures? No. Health department investigators spoke to medical staff at Yorkville Endoscopy, where Joan Rivers was being treated, and found that one of the doctors took photos of the late comedian while she was unconscious. The incident is one of many things Melissa says went wrong inside the clinic and she's filed a lawsuit against yorkville endoscopy and the doctors who were responsible for her mother's care in my opinion it was 100 percent preventable can someone give i don't know much about about melissa rivers but can someone give her a proper burial whenever her time comes please because the rivers family (laughs) <laughs> there's been no no bedside manner about their deaths <laughs> no that's... it's the father the, someone's calling up hey your dad's dead talk to you later and then joan joan they're like hey guys gather it wouldn't i will make him <laughs> silly faces <laughs> this would be sick on my instagram dude oh fuck she's dying <laughs> no one can handle the rivers family death swell it's very uh, uncomfortable yeah um but yeah very very sad but joan you know went out uh still completely lucid and was i like i said if she came up i think in the era of podcasting and with fan bases the way they are now i think would have been even bigger i'll say it that way because yes i i i did the same thing with shandling where i was saying like uh you know in a different generation like now where we all have streaming services and stuff like that i think the larry sanders show and uh, it's Gary Shandling's show would have been much bigger. And people were like, do you think we don't know who Gary Shandling is, Mike? I'm like, no, 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 but that's not my point. <laughs> I'm just saying comedy was uh, just a, you know, a smaller and more disrespected art form than 
so I think now Joan would have been even bigger than she was back in the day, but obviously had an illustrious career and was also roasted on Comedy Central, which is um, probably one of the perfect forms for her to be honored, I would say. So that's our uh, last clip, right? Yep. There was one other thing. It was it was kind of tough to clip, but it was fun. If you want to go uh, look it up on your own time, there was also a funny clip uh, when she was hosting The Tonight Show of her and Betty White basically talking about who's hotter. Because yeah. like we know them as old ladies, but it's just funny to think about it at that time. That's again when I talk about her, like she could have been a uh, a good podcaster or something like that, where she just had a very natural energy about her. Um, but we don't have a great norm clip for this week, and um, there is a tremendous uh, Gilbert Joan roast joke, but it was like three and a half minutes long. It's great. It was it's perfect Gilbert where you know it's like the aristocrats joke it's a thing where it's like okay well this has to be the punchline oh fuck he's still going yeah <laughs> just drags it out for three minutes about joan being a swamp monster <laughs> <laughs> uh but this is the great greg giraldo um another one of my favorites great greg giraldo talking about joan rivers as we wave goodbye to monetization oh the the today show clip already did that to us oh yeah that's true that's true yeah. Irritating Jew broad. The first time I heard your voice, my foreskin <laughs> fell off. What have you done to your upper lip? Did you blow a beehive? Holy shit, you look like Steven Tyler, f the life raft. <laughs> Seriously, I, I know you're not the only one here. All these rubber face monsters. What the f? What, what, what goes into people's heads out here? Why? Did you really, really? Is that good? What, how much worse <laughs> could your real face look? <laughs> that mask you've had welded on your head. You, <laughs> you used to look your age. Now you don't even look your species. You, you, you once said you succeeded by saying what everyone else is thinking, and that's not true. It's not true. I never heard you say, holy shit, what the f*** did I do to my face? I look like a surprised catfish. <laughs> Joan, you really are an absolutely incredible uh, talent. You're absolutely hysterical. Every comic I know respects you. That's a God's honest truth. Everyone thinks you're hilarious. I think you're the best. And at your age, you're still relevant, still cool. And uh, shit, you even got a, a boob job just a few years ago. You're every man's dream. And, and by that, I mean every man that dreams of titty fucking a crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> that also reminded me of a great scene in Louis where uh they're in joan's hotel room and louis talking to her about something and at the end you can kind of tell he's like hitting on her and joan's like all right come on <laughs> <laughs> fucks louis ck at the end of an episode <laughs> at age 75 or whatever she was <laughs> but yeah geraldo said it there like relevant all the way to the end where a lot of people didn't have that and even like like i said with rickles like Rickles was a legend, was still doing shows and stuff like that. And Joan and Rickles uh, toured together at the end also. But, like, Joan was relevant to the point where she was a pop culture reference all the way to her death. So uh, definitely a massive star for so many years. And like I said, I understand. I understand she's famous. Leave me alone in the comments. <laughs> or at least... At least if you've commented and then you get to the end, leave another comment and say, oh, now I understand. Yeah, let's see those comments with the edit. Thing yeah. Oh, the now I get what you meant. Thanks, <laughs> Mike, for a great episode. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, an absolute legend. And I, th I, I think that's my main point with people from that era is like pretty much all the legends are underappreciated with... I guess the exception of Pryor and Carlin and maybe, you know, Woody Allen, who went on to different things, you know, Steve Martin, who went on to movies and stuff like that. But as far as just stand-ups, like you hear Pryor and Carlin as these massive figures, um, but I don't think some of the people just underneath them uh, get the respect they deserve as far as influence that they've had that still lingers today. So hope you guys enjoyed hearing about Joan Rivers. Do you have a uh, uh, Mount Rushmore of female comics? Um, I mean, all time. Yeah, I guess it would be Phyllis Diller, Joan Rivers, Roseanne, and Ellen, probably. Roseanne, really? 
I'd, I'd put Roseanne on there. I mean, more for her TV influence. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not counting, you know, the Fox News specials. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> my pronouns are kiss my ass. Oh. Doesn't even make sense. The joke structure doesn't work. <laughs> I, see, I, I feel like I could make an argument. And I don't like this woman at all in terms of stand up, but Amy Schumer was pretty. For such a brief time, though. Yeah. I would put Sarah Silverman way ahead of Amy. I would put Maria Bamford way ahead of Amy. Really? Interesting. Oh, definitely. In terms of like, because I think Maria Bamford was so different that I do think it started inspiring, uh, you know, and I, I never liked this phrase, but like alt comics, like it inspired women to start doing yeah. different things other than say, hey, guys, my pussy stinks, you know? <laughs> I feel like, well, that was a major fucking uh you know development i think amy was at the forefront of that one not saying it was good but it was there well, but but my thing with amy is like i think amy's first special was funny and she was funny on a couple of roasts mm -hmm. but i think if you look at amy even at her height it's hard to argue she's way different than sarah silverman or joan rivers yeah i would put definitely put uh silverman ahead of her but i was just yeah. curious your thoughts oh it's not it's not a bad question guys how about you leave in your comments? You're Mount Rushmore of ladies. Yeah, come on. But like I said, I think there's, uh, you know, five or six female comics working right now that people haven't even necessarily heard of yet that are better than anyone we've gotten in the last 20 years in stand up, really. I got, mm -hmm. like I said, Jordan Jensen, Kelsey, Co Kelsey Cook's special last year, I think was better than anything like sarah silverman put out in the last 15 20 years so um so there you have it, folks my thought on joan rivers and women um, <laughs> yeah. so if you like that go to uh, blindmike.net if you if you wouldn't mind support this program everywhere you get podcasts all platforms and all the links are blindmike.net um subscribe on youtube tap the notification bell leave a comment like all that stuff helps us get noticed mm. uh by by new eyeballs and if you want to subscribe, we have a Patreon, or you can become a YouTube member. You get bonus ac access and uh, bonus content and early access. Um, yeah, if you're really wishing you listened to this last week, join the Patreon. Exactly. Yeah, you get it a week early. Um, and I think next week, time permitting, uh, we'll be doing Curb Your Enthusiasm. Nice. In honor of the last season. So stay tuned for that. Um, if you want to get ahead of that, go to the Patreon and uh check out craig everything craig's doing at verygoodshow.org go check it out and uh we will talk to you guys next time on why are you laughing zip it up and zip it out yeah.